Hey, Brooksiders. Thanks for joining us today. We're really glad that you're here. And wherever you're connecting from, if you happen to be new to Brookside Services, we'd love to know that you were with us today. You can help us out with that by heading over to connect.mybrookside.church and filling in our quick online connection card. When you do that, we'll make a donation to COVID-19 relief work going on in our city. Today, we're wrapping up our Say What? series, looking at some of the confusing and frustrating things Jesus said. But before we get to that, we invite you to join with us as we start off with some worship. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of way? Till I met you I was breathing But not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met Called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old made new Jesus, when I met you You called my name Out of the darkness to your glorious day, you called my name. I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness to your glorious day. needed rescue my sin was heavy chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you were my healing and your love is the air that I'm breathing Out of the darkness to your glorious day, you called my name. I ran out of that grave. Out of the dark. Well, today we're wrapping up our Say What series, and I can't blame you if you feel like it's been a bit of a rough ride. I mean, Jesus said some crazy things, but really, I'm here to let you know 
No matter how odd things sometimes sound, no matter how different the things Jesus says may seem, compared to what I think I know about him, there's one thing that I can always come back to. God wants what is best for me. He wants me to thrive. God is always kind, gentle, loving, and nurturing to me. Just look at the book of Luke in chapter 12, where Jesus says, dear friends. See that? Dear friends. He's so caring. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. See, he wants to protect us. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you after that. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he's the one to fear. <sighs> okay, can we just take a minute here? I mean, yikes, that escalated quickly from dear friend to kill you and throw you into hell in about three seconds flat. Wow. Wait, are you seriously ending the series with this? With I'll show you who to fear? Really? I'll tell you who to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you. To kill you. And that's not all. And then, and then throw you into hell. Where's the cuddly God who lives on a cloud and makes us happy and is gentle and mercy and grace and never gets angry? That's the God that I want. Unbelievable. The series was just made for 2020, wasn't it? Hi, welcome to Brookside Online. My name's Greg. I'm the lead pastor here at Brookside. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining with us today. Uh, I really hope that this will be a, a valuable time for you as you spend some time uh, digging into uh, the Word of God with me. Uh, we are in a series, it's called, uh, Say What? It's looking at some of the kind of crazy things that Jesus said, some of the things that Jesus spoke when he was teaching or when he was in ministry or just interacting with people that caused people around him to go, what in the world are you talking about? What's that supposed to mean? And today we're gonna to be wrapping up the series. We're, we're wrapping up today by looking at one that is a toughie. It's challenging, uh, believe me. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So let's jump into this. Here, this is one of them that Jesus said. This is in Luke chapter 12. Uh, Luke records it for us. He says this, I'll tell you who to, who to fear. This is Jesus speaking, fear God. Fear God who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he is the one to fear. Like, wow, what's that? What's that all about? Like that, that, that sounds kind of like those old scare tactics from when we were kids, you know, be good or the boogeyman's gonna get you, right? Like it, it just, it sounds like advocating fear, advocating intimidation in a relationship or, or kind of using judgment as a, as a threat to people, which all, all of that kind of seems to be in contradiction to this, the, the, our, per, our perception that God is a God of love and a God of grace and a God is warm and welcoming and, and you know, like, like the, the, the father figure, the mother figure, who's just kind of come on in, I, it's all love. And this seems so contrary to that. So what's going on? That's what we wanna find out today. So as I mentioned when we got started a couple of weeks back, some of these sayings are hard because they're just difficult to understand. Some of them, they're hard because they're just difficult to follow, difficult to, to accept. And this is, this is one that I think is kind of a little bit of both of those things, but I think as we dig into it, I think we can, we'll be able to kind of clear away some of the misconceptions or some of the assumptions that we may have. And as we go through, uh, I think we'll discover that the statement that Jesus made, understanding its context, understanding what he meant to say, is actually something that breathes new life and freedom and, and the opposite of fear into our lives. How is that possible? Let's find out. I want you to join in with me as we, as we do this. Let's look at this together. How do we make sense of this? That's kind of what we want to find out. And I, we're going to do it by answering a couple of questions together. Uh, simply these. 
So um, here's, what I, here's what I'd like us to do. We're gonna start off looking at what, what, does, what do we mean by fear? What, what's the meaning of the word? Uh, how should we understand it when he says, fear God? What does that mean? Uh, then we wanna look at what, what we know about fear, how it works in our lives, what's going, how, does it, how does it express itself and what does it do? And finally, how could a, how could a kind of a healthy fear of God actually be a good thing? How, uh, how, what, what's God kind of hoping to see accomplished in our lives because of it, all right? That's where we're gonna go. So why don't we, uh, why don't we begin? First question, what do we mean by fear? What is fear? Fear has two basic meanings and uh, I'll just kind of lay them out for us and talk about them a little bit, make sure we kind of are clear on them. The first meaning, uh, this is Merriam-Webster, Google it online if you want to check it out. Uh, the, the basic meaning of fear is simply this. It's an unpleasant emotion. It's caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. Something's threatening you. Something is potentially causing you harm. Uh, and there's, a, there's this recoil. There's, a, there's an apprehension. There's a fear. Uh, there, there, it's, 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 it's an unpleasant emotional response. The greater the unpredictability of the, of the potential harm, the, the, the greater the likelihood it's gonna happen, um, the greater the impact or, or, or the greater the degree of harm. All of these things have an influence on how much fear we experience. If it's, if it's, a, if it's a huge impact and it's, and it's almost certain to happen, we're gonna be flipping out, running for the hills. If it's not so big, it, it, it affects us differently. So it, our response is often uh, in measure to those kinds of things. When I was thinking about fear and kind of that knee-jerk sense of, of fear because of danger, one of the things that popped in my head, uh, I have a fear of sharks. Uh, I remember when I first saw the movie uh, Jaws when I was a kid, never should have watched that movie. It uh, scarred me for life. I was going to be an oceanographer. I was going to get into all that kind of cool stuff until I saw uh, Jaws. Now, I, you, here's a picture of a shark right here. Uh, I'm not afraid of this pic. I can look at it. It's like, oh, look at those pointy teeth. Isn't that interesting? Because uh, there's no threat right? There's no threat to me right now. I'm standing here. It's a picture. It's no big deal. Uh, it, the, 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 the threat level is low, so I don't have to worry about it. Now, if I was swimming in the water beside this guy, it'd be a different story. Um, I remember seeing the picture. It's kind of a classic picture of uh, some construction workers having lunch out on the girder. I think we've got that pic. Yeah. Uh, if I was one of these guys, I would be flipping out. Like just, just looking at this image of these guys sitting on a girder, having, having lunch, like it just sends shiver, shivers down my spine. It's like, uh, get me out of here. Uh, that's one kind of fear. It's that kind of unpleasant emotional response caused by anticipation uh, or awareness of danger. Now there is a second definition, a second way that f the term fear, the word fear is used, uh, especially in the scriptures, in the Bible, um, but it can be used in, in everyday life today, although not as much in this way. But it's, it's uh, the second one, if you look at Webster's Dictionary, you'll find it there again, and it's simply this, it's a profound reverence, it's an awe, it's, it's a sense of respect, it's a showing of respect for someone or something who is deserving of that respect. Um, I'm going to use a, a bit of an odd example. And, and instead of people, I'm going to talk about railways. I'm going to talk about trains. When I was 13 years old, I was visiting at my uncle's farm. I actually stayed there for the summer when I was a kid. And I was coming back from Saskatchewan to Ottawa. And I was going by train. A lot of fun. Great time on the train. Uh, except I had just one of those lean back chairs and I couldn't sleep. So wasn't, wasn't the best in that regard. But you know what? Not afraid of trains at all. I don't have a train a phobia uh, of any sort. I, I would have no fear of, of this train at all, unless of course I was standing on the train tracks, like right in front of it. 
then I would be petrified. Like I would be, I would be fearful. There would be a, 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 an appropriate response to that. And, and it would be the appropriate response to have a sense of fear when you're here in front of the train instead of in the train or in one of the seats in the cars of the train instead. Uh, choosing, choosing to not step on the train tracks in front of a train when it's coming is an expression of, of this idea of fear of the train. You're showing respect, you're showing reverence in that way. You're, you're saying, I understand that this thing weighs thousands and thousands of tons or kilograms and it's, it's moving, you know, maybe 80 kilometers an hour, uh, the momentum of this thing. If I hit it with my shoulder, if I, if I was like, oh, I'm gonna stop this thing, uh, I'm gonna be like splat like a bug on the front of the train. I'm not gonna do it. So I, I show respect for the train. I don't step in front of it, I step on it. I get inside it and I enjoy the ride. That's a healthy fear of trains. When you have that healthy respect, then you actually don't sense fear. You're not, you're not cowering, oh, I'm terrified of this train, because you avoid the things that could cause those kinds of problems. Um, and like I did when I was coming back from Saskatchewan, had a, had a, a great time and it kind of did all the work for me. It took me up the hills and down the, the other side and I was able to sleep and it carried on driving. Or couldn't sleep well, but you know what I mean. Like it, 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 that there's, there's benefit that I was able to receive because I uh, showed proper respect for the train. Fear can be that sense of reverence and respect. So. Those two ideas, those two definitions of, of fear, let's, let's keep those in mind and go back to that verse, verse 12, or verse five of Luke chapter 12, where Jesus talking to, actually to his disciples, to those that were uh, both his inner circle and those that were listening and were considering following him. They were interested in what he, was, what he had to say and they were, wondering whether they should listen to him, but they were also a little bit nervous because there was this whole crowd of kind of the religious authorities and the big shots in the community that were calling out Jesus and, and telling anybody that listened to him or followed him that they were fools, they, 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 were, they were crazy to follow and listen to this guy. Uh, and so there was this kind of tension going on in the, in the experience, in the, in the time when they were, uh, when they were there and Jesus tells, tells them, I tell you whom to fear. Fear God who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he is the one to fear. See, when it comes to the, the fear of God, you'll find that both of these definitions are at play to some extent. There is this sense of potential danger here, just like with the train, you get in front of that train, you're in trouble. Like, don't try and stop the train with your shoulder. It's, it doesn't end well. Uh, but they're, they're, they're the focus really of this passage and this statement is far more on the, uh, the, the benefit, the wisdom of respecting God for who he is, recognizing him for who he is and treating him in that way. Um, that's something that we uh, are being invited by Jesus to do here in this in this um, in this situation, so that's that's kind of what we what we want to uh, kind of focus in on here. Um, one of the things that I think is important for us to understand when when we consider Jesus' words here uh, is that 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 statement that's like we are responsible before God. God will bring judgment. God, just like the train is gonna carry down the tracks, God has a plan. God is going to one day um, bring judgment upon every single one of us, whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not. There, there really are consequences to our actions and consequences to our choices. And while a lot of people may push back on that idea and, and don't like the idea of hearing a, a warning, uh, the fact is, hearing a warning is actually a good thing. It's actually a, a, an expression of grace, an, ex, an expression of love. If somebody is about to step over a cliff, to say, hey, stop, 
is not being rude, it's not being annoying, it's not being critical, it's, it's trying to save their life, right? It's saying, you are about to go over, stop, you gotta stop. Um, Hearing a warning is, is, uh, is a good thing, assuming that the warning is true. You know, if you are, <laughs> that, that the old saying about, you know, yelling fire in a crowded theater, um, is, is, uh, and, and then there is no fire? Like, that, that's, that's a crime. That's, you're, you're in trouble. But yelling fire in a theater when there actually is a fire, you know, that could be a heroic thing, trying to rescue people, helping them out. Uh, knowing that there is a fire in the theater, and choosing not to warn anybody, that would be considered evil, right? Um, and yelling fire because there is a fire, even when people don't listen to you, and even when people just brush it off as if it isn't there, uh, continuing to encourage people, hey, there's a fire burning, you're, you're in trouble. Like that, that's an expression of grace because the people are, are pushing back and you're doing it anyway. So the question isn't whether a warning is, is, is good. If it's true, it's, it's a good thing. It's a valuable thing, regardless of how people respond. So what's Jesus' warning here? He's warning that God does have the power to bring your life to an end and to throw you into hell. Again, just like standing in front of that train uh, doesn't end well, neither does standing against God. Physical death and hell are the outcome. Now let's talk about hell for a minute because that's something that we don't often talk about very much and uh, is, there's often a lot of pushback on the whole concept, uh, unless it's, you know, the latest TV show or something like that, where it, we know that it's just kind of made up kind of deal. Um, so let's talk about it. It, it. Hell today is often, even, even in Christian circles where, uh, it's, where people kind of recognize that yes, there actually is a hell, it's, it's often our ideas of it, our concepts of it are shaded by like Dante's Inferno and all these other, all these other things. And for younger generations, it's Lucifer and stuff like that. Like there's, there's all kinds of, of things that kind of shade uh, our assumptions of what it means. Uh, the word hell, uh, in case you're wondering, has a very long <laughs> history to it. It's, it, it's the, the English transliteration of a Greek word, and that Greek word is a translation of an Aramaic word, which was a translation of a Hebrew phrase, which meant Valley of Hinnom. Doesn't sound all that scary, a valley, for the Valley of Hinnom. That, that it was a place in, uh, actually it was just outside of Jerusalem, um, way, way back in the day in history. Uh, it, was, it was associated with pagan worship rituals that included things as horrible as child sacrifice. Like that, that was the kind of thing that was happening in this valley. Uh, and later on, when uh, God's people, Jewish people, kind of took over that area, it, was, it, it became a garbage dump. And it, that's where people from the city would dump their junk, and it was actually usually lit up to, to burn it away, and it was, it was just this smoldering garbage heap. And that's, that's the idea, that, uh, uh, that's the word, or that's what the word hell was originally signifying. It meant this, it, it, it meant kind of, being thrown in the trash. Uh, not, not a pretty picture, you know, not the pitchforks and all the kind of stuff that we so often think of today, but it's still a, 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 a very sad and tragic outcome for anything or anyone. The place of God's punishment. Like that, that's, that's what Jesus is warning us of. And so what, what is Jesus really saying here? He's like helping people that were listening then and today uh, to understand like God is, God, God is real, God is there, God is, God is uh, the creator of this whole world, the creator of the universe and you and I, we are all living on his planet. We are his creations, we belong to him whether we recognize it or not, whether we like it or not, we are. Uh, and what does that mean for us? 
Well, one of the main things that it means for us from here is that God, because he is the kind of the rightful owner of the world and the universe and everything else, uh, he has the right to define what, what, what is and what is not acceptable, what is and what is not um, um, appropriate conduct, all that kind of stuff. He can set up the house rules. It's his house. You know? In my house, growing up, it's like, in my house, we do it this way. In my house, we do it that way. Uh, the, the, we had kind of house rules, and people wouldn't respect them. They wouldn't be welcome. Uh, God has house rules, and <laughs> the, the world is his house. So um, he has the right to basically, just like I would or you would, if somebody was, came into your house and started mistreating people in your family or, or taking advantage of things, you, had the, you have the right to say, uh, there's the door, out you go. Uh, God has that right too, to evict anyone that defies his house rules. And to say that, it, to say that it isn't cruel. To, to say that, it, it, it's a fair warning. It's, it's a recognition of, of reality and how we respond to it and how we, how we feel about it really depends on whether we want to, 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 like, to, to board the train, so to speak, or to step in front of it, right? So what is fear? Fear is that unpleasant emotional response caused by this anticipation or awareness of danger. And uh, there is potential danger if we are, can, are, are determined to uh, push against God, fight against God, it's not going to end well for any of us. But there's also this flip side, this other side, this sense of profound reverence and awe and respect that when we recognize who, God for who he is and for what he's done and for, for what he has the right to do, uh, we start to say, God, you are God, we trust you, we're, we're, we're submitting our ways to you, we're gonna follow, when you say go this way, we're gonna go this way, because we recognize that you are the one who calls the shots. So that, 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 that's kind of fundamental, basic uh, of understanding of fear and what it means to, to fear God. And what, what, what do we know about fear? Like what, what is it that, um, Jesus is wanting to get us to, to understand here um, because the, this verse, this statement is nestled into a larger context. There was a bigger conversation that was going on uh, and it helps understand why Jesus said it and what he was getting at. So I'd like us to, to kind of focus in on that for a little bit and see what it was that Jesus was getting at. And as we do, we can, the, the main thing, and, the, and there's other things, but there's this one thing that I really want us to, to think about for a couple of minutes is simply this. You know, you can choose what you fear. You can choose who you fear. Um, Jesus was getting at that when he was making this statement. If you just back up a, a verse, and again, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, uh, probably out on the road or out in a, in a marketplace or something like that as they were going along. And he said to them uh, about the people that were actually opposing them, he said, dear friends, so he's talking to his, to his intimate friends here, verse four, dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They, they cannot do any more to you after that. Sounds like a lot, <laughs> right? Killing my body, that sounds pretty big. Um, my body is pretty much most of me that I see and that I interact with, right? So that, that's, so it's big, but he's saying like, don't, don't fear that. Don't, don't be worried about enemies who all they can do, the worst they can do is kill you. I'll tell you whom to fear instead, fear God who has the power to kill you and throw you into hell. He's the one to fear. Like he's saying, you know what? There's, there, there's people around you that are trying to attack you, trying to push you, trying to swerve you away from God. And, and they, uh, in, in this case, they were, they were using threats of violence and attack and everything else. For us today, we don't often have threats of violence and attack, although it's happening in a lot of places around the world today. Uh, in our culture, it's more often threats of ostracism, threats of ridicule, threats of, of being uh, left out, um, all kinds of things for following Jesus, for believing Jesus, for believing what the Bible teaches us. And Jesus here is saying, 
as, as like, the, the, those things are nothing compared to God and God's power. Don't, don't listen to their threats. Don't follow their advice. Listen to God's. Follow his advice. He's the one, he, he, again, like, don't, don't be worried about a, a bicycle coming and bumping up against a train. The train's going to win the day. Like, it, it, we can trust him. We can listen to God, fear God, respect God, revere him, trust him instead. That's what Paul is doing here. Um, I remember hearing the story of a guy by the name of Joseph uh, who was actually, it, this was in, the, in communist Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, a number of years ago, and he was uh, seeking to follow Jesus and teach people. He was a pastor, and uh, he was con- constantly uh, being arrested and uh, uh, tortured and mistreated and all kinds of things. And he tells a story about one day where, uh, after some pretty, pretty horrible treatment, the the tormentor, the I think he was a. a prison guard, captain, or whatever. Uh, he finally said to Joseph, he said, look, don't you understand? I have the power to kill you. And Joseph responded to him. He said, sir, your greatest weapon is killing. My greatest weapon is dying. If you kill me and I die for what I believe and for what I teach, the message that I have sent out will, 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 will go out a hundred times stronger because people will know I sealed this with my blood. He, and the guy ended up releasing him. He didn't know how to even respond to that. But um, Joseph understood that to uh, have a fear of God, to revere him, to trust him, means that we can stand up and have confidence in the face of the attack of somebody else. We don't have to be afraid of them. And most people, uh, they, they end up choosing. One, well, we actually all do in one way or the other. We're choosing who we're going to fear, what we're going to fear, what we're going to listen to and what we're not going to listen to. In Acts chapter 24, um, in uh, Luke, we're kind of recording the, the history of the beginning of the, er- of the church, the launch of the early church. He has the Apostle Paul in Luke, or in Acts 24. Uh, he's been captured, he's in prison. He's standing before the governor, uh, who is a Roman uh, uh, leader. He has the authority and the power to either bring execution upon Paul or give him his freedom, all this kind of stuff. And Paul is sharing his story. He's giving his defense before uh, the, the, the before the governor and it says to him, as he reasoned to them and he talked to them about righteousness and self-control and the coming day of judgment, Felix, who was the, the, um, uh, the governor uh, said, he became frightened. He became frightened by what Paul was saying and he, and he said, go away, Get it, go away for now. You know, he replied, when it's more convenient, I'll, I'll call for you again. You know, he had the, all this power, all this authority. He had other people that were afraid of him, but when it came right down to it, he was terrified of the potential that God was there. And he had this choice. Either I'm going to bow my knee, I'm going to recognize God for who he is, or I'm going to, I'm going to walk away. And um, Paul, or, or Jesus actually in this passage that, we are, that we're looking at in, in Luke chapter 12, he's like, don't listen to them. Don't go that way. You have the choice. You can choose who you're going to fear. Fear, you can fear people who have, you know, crazy, they do things, you're uncontrollable, who knows what they may do next. Or you can fear God who is righteous and holy and loving and caring and and in control of all things. Like, you can trust him instead and then you don't have to fear other things. And that, that brings us just to the last question. Uh, which was simply this, what does a healthy fear of God accomplish? Like what, 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 what does it do in our lives? And, and, and this is kind of 
crazy when you think about it because it's, it's almost complete reversal of what we expect. You know, when, when, when you hear, oh, we're supposed to fear God, it's like, great, there's somebody else, something else that I need to fear on top of all my other phobias and stuff, right? And, and it's like, no, when, when you truly have a healthy fear of God, a healthy respect for him, you understand his ways and you're willing to follow them, uh, it sets you free. It sets you free from, all th- from everything else and from everything else. That's, that's what Jesus was getting that at in this whole thing. Uh, if you go right back up to the, to the first verse of this chapter, uh, we get kind of a fuller picture of the context. And this is what it says. Uh, the crowds were growing uh, until thousands were milling about and stepping on each other. And Jesus turned first to his disciples and warned them, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, their, their hypocrisy. Uh, and, and he was talking about those religious leaders, the people in control who were uh, pretending to follow God. They were saying they were all about godliness and spirituality and all this kind of stuff. Instead, they were there for themselves. They were looking after themselves. They were doing all kinds of things to keep control and power on the people. Uh, and he was saying, like, don't, don't listen to that. Don't go the way they're going. Don't buy into their hypocrisy because all they were trying to do was curry favor and avoid the fury of those in greater power. It kind of reminds me of what I've been seeing over the last number of weeks after the election of our neighbors down south. Certain person who's refusing to uh, accept the outcome and, and, and all kinds of leaders who are supposed to be you know, f- following the, a, a certain set of, of, of ways and who are supposed to be uh, living up to the oaths that they have taken. And they're, they're, they're just cowering, it seems, in fear of uh, a tantrum or a Twitter post or whatever. They're, they're afraid of a person instead of following uh, what they're supposed to be following. Jesus says, don't play that game. Don't, don't, don't go there. Be careful. Don't fall into that trap. Don't, don't buy into hypocrisy. Instead, he goes, a time is coming when everything that's covered up will be revealed and all that is secret will be made known to everybody. Whatever you've said in the dark will be heard in the light and what you've whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. And for those who are faithfully following Jesus, that's kind of a cool thought. It's like, wow, all, all those things that I've done for you, Lord, that nobody else seemed to even know about, that's, that's gonna be noticed, that's gonna, people are gonna be aware of that. And for people that are hiding behind closed doors and doing things that are contrary to the will of God and the ways of God, that's all gonna be exposed too. It's all gonna be right out there. Boom, there it is. Um, um, that's, what, that, that's what Jesus was kind of leading into his statement about fearing God from. It's like, don't live for that kind of thing. Don't try to impress people. Don't live in fear of what you can or cannot get from other people. Just follow the Lord, trust him, keep his ways. And he, and he ends it after saying, you know, you need that God is the one you, you need to fear. He goes on to say this, verse six, he says, what, what's the price of, a, of five sparrows? A couple of copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. The very hairs on your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You're more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. So it's like, I'll show you whom to, be, to, to, to fear, and when you do, you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to be, you don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live filled with anxiety and worry and all that kind of stuff because of the, of, of, of the, the, the impact that a healthy fear of God will bring. And usually it's, it's often one or the other. I'm trusting God, I'm, I'm, I'm respecting God, I'm fearing God, or I'm trusting in something else and worried about something else and fearing something else. We, it, it's, it, it's, it's this, this trade-off that, that we have. And, and Jesus is saying, here's the way to live. Here's the way to find, find hope and peace. You know, we're, we're told in the Bible actually over and over that fearing God is a good thing. It's a healthy thing. In, in Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, we're told the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's, the, it's what helps orient us around truth and the right way of living and everything else. Fearing God, respecting God for who he is, treating him as, as he deserves. Uh, it's the way that leads to 
a healthy life. It's a way that leads to uh, experiencing a life free of fear of other things. I've, I've seen that in my own life. If you've been following Jesus for any period of time, you probably have too. And so many people today, their biggest fear is fear of death. And, and, and they'll do everything possible to put it off and, and not think about it. And we even hide away those that are elderly and sick in our, in our culture here because we don't want to be reminded that our lives are as short as they are. Um, I'm not worried. It, 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 there's no fear. Maybe of the mode, <laughs> of the way it happens. There's, you know, there's some ways that I prefer, but we can have hope and confidence and peace and joy in our lives today as we trust Jesus. So, who should we fear? You can either fear this world, you can fear the people around you, you can fear those who have seemingly influence upon you, you can fear the economy, you can fear the pandemic, you can fear uh, all kinds of things. Or you can fear God and lose your fear of all those other things. To me, the, obvi- the choice is obvious. I hope it is for you too. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness and for your grace and for um, giving us these reminders, these uh, warnings, these encouragements, these, these nudges in the right direction, helping steer us in a way that leads to life and to hope and to peace and fulfillment and, and an absence of anxiety and worry and all these other things. God, help us to hear your voice and follow you and experience the blessing and the freedom that comes when we fear you in the way that you deserve. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe Live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe Live for you Live for you And holy There is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe live for you live for you holy there is no one like you there you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love.
Hey Brookside, things are busy around here and we want you to know what's going on. Over the last few years around this time, Brookside has done a collection of items for Restoring Hope, one of Ottawa's only shelters for homeless youth. So normally we would be asking you to go out and pick up some items like warm socks or thermal underwear to donate to Restoring Hope as a way to show that we care about the vulnerable young people that they serve. This year though, as you know, things are a little different, and going out shopping and handing around items may not be the best idea. So we're modifying our approach this year. We want to ask you to give to Restoring Hope financially so that they can directly purchase the items they need. So from November 27th to December 20th, any funds given to Brookside that are designated for the Missions Fund will be passed on to Restoring Hope. If you give through e-transfer, just put Missions Fund and the amount of out of your donation that you want to designate for that in the note or memo field when you send the e-transfer. If you give by check, you can just include a note with your check about how much you want to designate to the missions fund. Helping Restoring Hope in this way is easy, it's safe, and it helps to communicate to youth living on the streets that someone cares about them. You can do that anytime between now and December 20th by designating a portion of your Brookside giving to the missions fund. Coming up on December 13th, we're going to debut a new way to experience Brookside services online together. We're going to start streaming them on the church online platform. You don't really need to know what that is. You just need to know that that's where we're hoping everyone will gather online for our worship services, as it will help us all to engage and connect a little bit better. There are more details in the Brookside Brief email newsletter, but just know that in a couple of weeks, we'll have a new and we hope an improved way to experience Brookside services together. So be watching for that. If you're new to Brookside, we'd also love to know that you joined us here today. Please fill in our online connection card at connect.mybrookside.church. Just let us know a little bit about yourself. And when you do that, we'll make a donation to Respond Ottawa and their efforts to meet needs across our city during the current COVID-19 crisis. So connect with us and help with crisis response in our city at the same time. Just go to connect.mybrookside.church. Thanks for doing that. We really appreciate it. And if you are new, or even if you're not, consider coming out to one of our online connection events going on all the time, like the board game night that's happening online on Saturday, December 12th, or the weekly Wednesday night hangout at 7 p.m., or the virtual lobby on Sundays, both before and after the service. Be sure to stay connected and get to know some Brooksiders a little bit better. We'd love to see you at any of those events. Links are in the Brookside Brief email newsletter, 
which you can sign up for at the website at mybrookside.church. Our mission at Brookside is to help develop fully engaged followers of Christ. We know that's what Jesus wants us to do, and so we're always working to do just that. But we need your support to enable Brookside to connect with more people in our communities and help them connect with Jesus. We know that's important to a lot of you, too, and we want to thank you for giving generously of your finances to help see more of that happen. You can give through check, pre-authorized debit, or e-transfer, and all the instructions can be found at mybrookside.church giving. Thanks again for being here with us today. If you're watching this during the Sunday morning premiere, head on over to the virtual lobby. It's open right now on Zoom, and you can get there by going to mybrookside.church slash lobby. Come on by for a bit, and if we don't see you there, maybe we can connect again at one of our online events coming up this week. See you soon.